Welcome everybody. Hi, my name is Danelle and um, I want to welcome you to the Norman Williams Library um, on this fabulous Wassel weekend. Thanks for coming in and sharing this time. My hand is an old very story to us. Um, this building was built in 1883, in case some of you don't know, and was given as a gift to the people of the town. And um, it's privately funded, we get some money from the town, but over 60% of our budget is comes from donations, so we appreciate any donations that may come our way. Um, I want to thank Diana Kay, who is here filming this for WCTV8. Um, it will be on the local TV station, and then it will also be on WCTV8.com if you need to see it later. Or a little bit missed or whatever. Um, or if you, you have friends who didn't see it, say, hey, this thing, you got to come see it next year. Um, Hannah's been doing this for a number of years now. We were just discussing that. Can't, I can't remember. <laughs> a fair few. Um, yeah, and so, and Diana would like me to remind everybody all devices that, you know, beep and make noise and things, if we can make them so they don't beep and make noise and things, that would be awesome. Um, Hamilton Gillett was raised in Woodstock, and he left and spent 15 years as a professional actor. Um, came back here about 25 years ago to seek his fame and fortune as a recycling goober, which is his career. <laughs> um, he lives in Windsor, and we're very happy to have him here to read to us A Child's Christmas in Wales. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And you won't miss the parade. I'll read fast. <laughs> I think we have parades at two, right? Yeah. yeah, OK. I won't read that fast. <laughs> um, some of you may have been here before. Um, at what I, there, there are a number of terms um, when I read this that are maybe unfamiliar to some people's ears. And so I just mention them before I read them so that if you don't know what the words mean, that you'll know them and it'll make a little bit more sense to you. Um, so a muffler, who knows what a muffler is? Not the kind on a car. Scarf, right? Thank you. Oh, show and tell. Excellent. Um, Galoshes, most yeah, boots, overshoes, um, a tam o shanter is a hat, um, a tea cozy. I call it like a uh, yeah, it's a quilted or something thing that goes over a. Those of you who make pots of tea makes your tea keeps your tea warm. Um, this one is not as familiar. Busby. I often wonder if Busby Berkeley's name came. Bob? It's like the, chain, the, the guards at Buckingham Palace, the tall, black, fuzzy things. That's a, that's a Busby. Um, uh, balaclava. That's a, like a ski mask. When you rob a convenience store, you wear one of those. Um, uh, sugar fag. It's a cigarette. Uh, and a sugar fag is a sugar cigarette. I'm sure lots of you had those when you were a little candy, a candy cigarette. It's white and had a little pink tip on it. Um, crackers. Crackers are the British tradition, I believe, that or Welsh, whatever you put them by your setting your place setting at you know, holidays and everybody has one you cross your arms my family we never can remember which one and somebody gets a face full of toys and somebody else doesn't explode at all but they they pop um spats yep white things that men used to strap over their when their shoes laced up high they wore them over their shoes um a briar is a pipe, thank you. Um, Leonardo is, refers to Leonardo da Vinci. Um, There's a reference to him. And the last one is um, a bowler, which is a hat like Charlie Chaplin wore. OK, you're all set now. <clears throat> um, 
<clears throat> Glad you did that now. <laughs> One Christmas was so much like another in those years around the sea town corner, now and out of all sound, except the distant speaking of the voices I sometimes hear a moment before sleep that I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was 12, or whether it snowed for 12 days and 12 nights when I was six. All the Christmases rolled down toward the two-tongued sea like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street. And they stop at the rim of the ice-edged, fish-freezing waves and I plunge my hands in the snow and bring out whatever I can find. In goes my hand into that wool-white, bell-tongued ball of holidays resting at the rim of the carol-singing sea, and out come Mrs. Prothero and the firemen. It was on the afternoon of the day of Christmas Eve, and I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden waiting for cats with her son Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December, in my memory, is white as Lapland, though there were no reindeer. But there were cats, patient, cold, and callous, our hands wrapped in socks, we waited to snowball the cats. Sleek and long as jaguars and horrible whiskered, spitting and snarling, they would slink and sidle over the white back garden walls. And the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, fur-capped and moccasined trappers from Hudson Bay off Mumbles Road, would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of their eyes. The wise cats never appeared. We were so still, Eskimo-footed Arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows, eternal ever since Wednesday, that we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden, or if we heard it at all, it was to us like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbor's polar cat. But soon the voice grew louder. Fire, cried Mrs. Prothero, and she beat the dinner gong. And we ran down the garden with the snowballs in our arms toward the house, and smoke indeed was pouring out of the dining room, and the gong was bombolating and Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like a town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales standing on the wall in a row. We bounded into the house laden with snowballs and stopped at the open door of the smoke-filled room. <clears throat> Something was burning all right. Perhaps it was Mr. Prothero who always slept there after midday dinner with a newspaper over his face. But he was standing in the middle of the room saying, a fine Christmas, and smacking at the smoke with a slipper. Call the fire brigade, cried Mrs. Prothero as she beat the gong. They won't be there, said Mr. Prothero. It's Christmas. There was no fire to be seen only clouds of smoke and Mr. Prothero standing in the middle of them, waving his slippers as though he were conducting. Do something, he said. And we threw all our snowballs into the smoke. I think we missed Mr. Prothero. And we ran out of the house to the telephone box. Let's call the police as well, Jim said, and the ambulance, and Ernie Jenkins, he likes fires. But we only called the fire brigade. And soon the fire engine came, and three tall men in helmets brought a hose into the house. And Mr. Prothero got out just in time before they turned it on. Nobody could have had a noisier Christmas. 
And when the firemen turned off the hose and were standing in the wet, smoky room, Jim's aunt, Miss Prothero, came downstairs and peered in at them. She said the right thing always. Jim and I waited very quietly to hear what she would say. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets, standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs, and she said, would you like anything to read? <laughs> years and years and years ago, <clears throat> when I was a boy, when there were wolves in Wales and birds the color of red flannel petticoats whisked past the harp-shaped hills, when we sang and wallowed all night and day in caves that smelt like Sunday afternoons in damp front farmhouse parlors. And we chased with the jawbones of deacons, the English and the bears, before the motor car, before the wheel, before the duchess-faced horse, when we rode the daft and happy hills bareback it snowed and it snowed. But here a small boy says, it snowed last year too, and I made a snowman, and my brother knocked it down, and then I knocked my brother down, and then we had tea. <laughs> but that was not the same snow, I say. Our snow was not only shaken from whitewash buckets down the sky, it came shawling out of the ground and swam and drifted out of the arms and hands and bodies of the trees. Snow grew overnight on the roofs of the houses like a pure and grandfather moss, minutely white ivied the walls and settled on the postman opening the gate like a dumb, numb thunderstorm of white torn Christmas cards. Were there postmen then too? With sprinkling eyes and wind cherried noses, on spread frozen feet they crunched up to the doors and mittened on them manfully, but all that the children could hear was a ringing of bells. You mean that the postmen went rat-a-tat-tat and the door rang? I mean that the bells that the children could hear were inside them. I only hear thunder sometimes, never bells. Oh, there were church bells too. Inside them? No, no, no. In the bat black snow white belfries tugged by bishops and storks. And they rang their tidings over the bandaged town, over the frozen foam of the powder and ice cream hills, over the crackling sea. It seemed that all the churches boomed for joy under my window, and the weathercocks crew for Christmas on our fence. Well, get back to the postmen. They were just ordinary postmen, fond of walking and dogs and Christmas and the snow. They knocked on the doors with blue knuckles. Ours has got a black knocker. And then they stood on the white welcome mat in the little drifted porches and huffed and puffed, making ghosts with their breath, and jogged from foot to foot like small boys wanting to go out. And then the presents, and then the presents after the Christmas box. And the cold postman, with a nose, with a rose on his button nose, tingled down the tea tray slithered chilly glinting hill. He went in his ice-bound boots like a man on fishmonger's slabs. He wagged his bag like a frozen camel's hump, dizzily turned the corner on one foot, and by God he was gone. Get back to the presents. There were the useful presents, engulfing mufflers of the old coach days, and mittens made for giant sloths, zebra scarves of a substance like silky gum that could be tug-award down to the galoshes, 
blinding tam shanters like patchwork tea cozies and bunny-suited busbies and balaclavas for victims of head-shrinking tribes. From aunts who always wore wool next to the skin, there were mustached and rasping vests that made you wonder why the aunts had any skin left at all. And once, I had a little crocheted nose bag from an aunt, alas, now no longer whinnying with us. And pictureless books in which small boys, though warned with quotations not to, would skate on Farmer Giles' pond and did and drowned. And books that told me everything about the wasp, except why. Go on to the useless presents. Bags of moist and many colored jelly babies and a folded flag and a false nose and a tram conductor's cap and a machine that punched tickets and rang a bell. Never a catapult. Once by mistake that no one could explain, a little hatchet and a celluloid duck that made, when you pressed it, a most un-duck-like sound, a mewing moo that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow, and a painting book in which I could make the grass, the trees, the sea, and the animals any color I pleased, and still the dazzling sky-blue sheep are grazing in the red field under the rainbow-billed and pea-green birds. Hard boils, toffee, fudge, and all sorts, crunches, cracknels, humbugs, glaciers, marzipan, and butter Welsh for the Welsh. And troops of bright tin soldiers who, if they could not fight, could always run. And snakes and families and happy ladders and easy hobby games for little engineers, complete with instructions, oh, easy for Leonardo and a whistle to make the dogs bark, to wake up the old man next door, to make him beat on the wall with his stick to shake our picture off the wall, and a packet of cigarettes. You put one in your mouth, and you stood at the corner of the street, and you waited for hours in vain for an old lady to scold you for smoking a cigarette, and then with a smirk, you ate it. And then it was breakfast under the balloons. Were there uncles like in our house? There are always uncles at Christmas, the same uncles. And on Christmas mornings with dog disturbing whistle and sugar fags, I would scour the swatched town for the news of the little world and find always a dead bird by the white post office or by the deserted swings perhaps a robin, all but one of his fires out. Men and women wading or scooping back from chapel with taproom noses and wind-bust cheeks, all albinos, huddled their stiff, black, jarring feathers against the irreligious snow. Mistletoe hung from the gas brackets in all the front parlors. There was sherry, and walnuts, and bottled beer, and crackers by the dessert spoons, and cats in their furabouts watched the fires. And the high-heaped fire spat, all ready for the chestnuts and mulling pokers. Some few large men sat in the front parlors without their collars, uncles almost certainly, trying their new cigars, holding them out judiciously at arm's length, returning them to their mouths, coughing, then holding them out again as though waiting for the explosion. And some few small aunts, not wanted in the kitchen, nor anywhere else for that matter, sat on the very edges of their chairs, poised and brittle, afraid to break like faded cups and saucers. Not many those morning trod the piling streets. An old man always, fawn-bowlered, 
yellow gloved, and at this time of year with spats of snow, would take his constitutional to the white bowling green and back, as he would take it wet or fine on Christmas Day or Doomsday. Sometimes, two hale young men with big pipes blazing, no overcoats, and wind-blown scarves would trudge unspeaking down to the forlorn sea to work up an appetite, to blow away the fumes, who knows, to walk into the waves until nothing of them was left but the two curling smoke clouds of their inextinguishable briars. Then I would be slap dashing home the gravy smell of the dinners of others, the bird smell, the brandy, the pudding and mints coiling up to my nostrils, when out of a snow-clogged side lane would come a boy, the spit of myself, with a pink-tipped cigarette and the violet past of a black eye, cocky as a bullfinch, leering all to himself. I hated him on sight and sound, and would be about to put my dog whistle to my lips and blow him off the face of Christmas, when suddenly he, with a violet wink, put his whistle to his lips and blew so stridently, so high, so exquisitely loud, that gobbling faces, their cheeks bulged with goose, would press against their tinseled windows the whole length of the white echoing street. For dinner, we had turkey and blazing pudding, and after dinner, the uncle sat in front of the fire, loosened all buttons, put their large, moist hands over their watch chains, groaned a little, and slept. Mothers, aunts, and sisters scuttled to and fro, bearing tureens. Auntie Bessie, who had already been frightened twice by a clockwork mouse, whimpered at the sideboard and had some elderberry wine. The dog was sick. Auntie Dosie had to have three aspirins, but Auntie Hannah, who liked port, stood in the middle of the snowbound backyard, singing like a big-bosomed thrush. I would blow up balloons to see how big they would blow up to, and when they burst, which they all did, the uncles jumped and rumbled. In the rich and heavy afternoon, the uncles breathing like dolphins and the snow descending, I would sit among festoons and Chinese lanterns and nibble dates and try to make a model man of war following the instructions for little engineers and produce what might be mistaken for a seagoing tram car. Or I would go out my bright new boots squeaking into the white world onto the seaward hill and call on Jim and Dan and Jack and to pad through the still streets leaving huge deep footprints on the hidden pavements. I bet people will think there's been hippos. What would you do if you saw a hippo running down the street? I'd go like this, bang! I'd throw him over the railings and I'd roll him down the hill, and then I'd tickle him under the ear, and he'd wag his tail. What would you do if you saw two hippos? Iron flanked and bellowing he hippos clanked and battered through the scudding snow towards us as we passed Mr. Daniel's house. Let's post Mr. Daniel a snowball through his letterbox. Let's write things in the snow. Let's write Mr. Daniel looks like a spaniel all over his lawn. Or we walked on the white shore. Can the fishes see it's snowing? The silent, one-clouded heavens drifted onto the sea. Now, we were snow-blind travelers lost on the North Hills and vast dew-lapped dogs with flasks round their necks ambled and shambled up to us baying excelsior. We returned home through the poor streets where only a few children fumbled with bare red fingers in the wheel-rutted snow and cat-called after us 
their voices fading away as we trudged uphill into the cries of the dock birds and the hooting of ships out in the whirling bay. And then at tea, the recovered uncles would be jolly, and the ice cake loomed in the center of the table like a marble grave. Auntie Hannah laced her tea with rum because it was only once a year. Bring out the tall tales now that we told by the fire as the gaslight bubbled like a diver. Ghost hooed like owls in the long nights when I dared not look over my shoulder. Animals lurked in the cubby hole under the stairs where the gas meter ticked. And I remember that we went singing carols once when there wasn't the shaving of a moon to light the flying streets. At the end of a long road was a drive that led to a large house. And we stumbled up the darkness of the drive that night, each one of us afraid, each one holding a stone in his hand in case, and all of us too brave to say a word. The wind through the trees made noises as of old and unpleasant and maybe web-footed men wheezing in caves. We reached the black bulk of the house. What shall we give them, hark the herald? No, Jack said. Good King Wenceslas, I'll count three. One, two, three, and we began to sing. Our voices high and seemingly distant in the snow-felted darkness round the house that was occupied by nobody we knew. We stood close together near the dark door. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. And then a small, dry voice, like the voice of someone who has not spoken for a long time, joined our singing. A small, dry, eggshell voice from the other side of the door. A small, dry voice through the keyhole. And when we stopped running, we were outside of our house. The front room was lovely. Balloons floated under the hot water bottle gulping gas. Everything was good again and shone over the town. Perhaps it was a ghost, Jim said. Perhaps it was trolls, Dan said, who was always reading. Let's go in and see if there's any jelly left, Jack said. And we did that. Always on Christmas night, there was music. An uncle played the fiddle. A cousin sang Cherry Ripe, and another sang Drake's Drum. It was very warm in the little house. Auntie Hannah, who had got onto the parsnip wine, sang a song about bleeding hearts and death, and then another in which she said her heart was like a bird's nest. And then everybody laughed again, and then I went to bed. Looking through my bedroom window, out into the moonlight and the unending smoke-colored snow, I could see the lights in the windows of all the other houses on our hill and hear the music rising from them up the long, steadily falling night. I turned the gas down. I got into bed. I said some words to the close and holy darkness, and then I slept.